Hello everyone and welcome to EduSearch Small Talk series where we discuss some key topics related to medical and surgical practice. Today we are going to see part 2 of our Colloidal Cyst uh, topic. In the part 1, if you have missed, you can see the video link in the description below. We have discussed the classification of Colloidal Cyst, the various theories of its for formation, abnormal pancreatico biliary duct junction. And we have also discussed why it is important to know about colloidal cyst and the carcinogenesis of colloidal cyst. A lot of multiple choice questions were also discussed. Today we are going to discuss the clinical presentation of colloidal cyst patients, the various investigations that can be done to diagnose and the management of colloidal cyst. So in this part two, we are going to discuss these topics. So clinical presentation, 80% of the patients present before the age of 10 years, that is more common in childhood. The classic triad of colloidal cyst, and this is a very commonly asked multiple choice question. However, the triad is seen in less than 20% of patients. The, what is the triad? It is abdominal pain, jaundice and palpable abdominal mass. In neonates, it can present as obstructive jaundice and abdominal masses, whereas in adults, it's more commonly present with pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, and jaundice. So clinical presentation is different in different age groups. All these are MCQs and very important to remember when you see patients in your clinics. Colloidal cysts can also present with complications. So when different complications occur. What are the possibilities in which the patient present? So the patient can present with a calculus cholecystitis. The patient can present with cholangitis and pancreatitis. Long-term undiagnosed colloidal cysts can lead to secondary biliary cirrhosis, cirrhosis associated portal hypertension and cancer. So a direct presentation of colloidal cysts can be end-state liver disease, portal hypertension, or associated cancers. Type 4A and 5, that is the colloidal cyst which involve the intrahepatic biliary ducts, can lead to liver abscess and can lead to life-threatening sepsis. Apart from this, a very rare complication of colloidal cyst is a spontaneous rupture. This is seen in 1% to 12% cases. Again, a multiple choice question. And the site of rupture is the junction of cystic and common bile duct most commonly. Very rare is cogastric outlet obstruction, which is more commonly seen with colloidal related induced susception, or colloidal cyst is large and obstructs the duodenal lumen. So these are some of the complications of colloidal cyst, and its clinical presentation can also be with these complications. So what are the different investigations? As you all know, most important is the imaging. Apart from this, there are some routine blood tests that we do in patients with colloidal cysts. These include the liver profile, of course, with PT, PTT, INR, amylase and lipase, complete blood count, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, C-reactive protein. And we also do tumor markers in clinically relevant setting. And these markers include CEA and CA 19.9. Coming to imaging, usually when patients present in outpatients with abdominal pain or obstructive jaundice, ultrasound is the first investigation. What ultrasound can show is a cyst separate from gallbladder, right? It will show a cystic lesion separate from gallbladder in continuation with the biliary tree. So this is the feature of colloidal cyst on ultrasound. Sensitivity of ultrasound to diagnose colloidal cyst is 71 to 97%. IDA scan is not routinely used for colloidal cyst in adults, but it is more commonly used in neonates and children, where it predominantly helps in differentiation from biliary atresia. Because here, the initial area of photopenia in the cyst is followed by subsequent filling, and this is followed by delayed emptying into the bowel. So this is the characteristic feature of colloidal cyst on IDA scan. Sensitivity is 100% for type 1 and 67% for type 4A, right? Most commonly done 
imaging investigation in outpatient setting when we see abdominal pain patients is a contrast and a CT scan. However, now we know that for biliary imaging, MRI scores above CT scan. However, if a CT is done, it is 93% sensitive for visualizing the biliary tree and 90% sensitive to demonstrate the cystobiliary communication. CT, however, is more useful in showing presence of associated malignancy as well as operability and it can differentiate localized versus segmental involvement in type 4A and type 5 cyst. That is basically in the intrahepatic biliary radical choledocal cyst. It will help in differentiating a localized versus segmental involvement. Like I said, the gold standard is an MRI or an MRCP. MRCP is a T2 MRI without contrast. Bilex has the contrast in MRCP, right? So it is the gold standard with 92 to 100% sensitivity. Secretin enhanced MRCP increases the sensitivity in diagnosing abnormal pancreatico biliary ductal junction. MRCP is useful because there is no contrast required. Like I said, it is heavily T2 weighted sequence. Endoscopic ultrasound is predominantly helpful in type 3 disease, that is choledococcal. ERCP and PTC, that is endoscopy and percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography, are not a diagnostic procedure any longer because we have modalities that we have discussed, and a combination of these modalities, other than endoscopy, are going to give you the diagnosis of choledocal cyst in almost all the cases. So these are the investigations that we commonly do. Coming to management, we will see management based on the type of choledocal cyst. Again, I would like to say that if you have missed the previous presentation, there is a link in the description below. So kindly go through that presentation to know the types of choledocal cyst. So type 1 choledocal cyst, all three A, B and C, the treatment is complete surgical excision with cholecystectomy and RUNY hepatico jejunostomy. In type 2, the treatment is surgery, again, diverticulectomy with primary CBD repair, or you can do excision and RUNY hepatico jejunostomy. So in type 1 and 2, basically the treatment is surgery with complete excision and RUNY hepatico jejunostomy. In type 3, you can do an endoscopic drainage or a transduodenal excision or sphincteroplasty. And rarely you will need a Whipple procedure for a choledoco seal. Type 4B, I have taken first because 4B is predominantly extrahepatic disease. Again, the treatment is complete surgical excision with cholecystectomy and RUNY hepatico jejunostomy. Type 4A is intra plus extrahepatic. So, for extrahepatic disease, the treatment is same. But for intrahepatic disease, if it's confined to one lobe, you can do a liver resection. However, if it is confined to both lobes, it is bilobal disease, then you may need a liver transplant. So for Keralis disease, resection is possible if the disease is unilobar and liver transplant when the disease is diffuse and bilobar or when there is secondary biliary cirrhosis with portal hypertension or when there is a suspicion of malignancy. Aggressive surgery is required in all these types with complete resection. However, it is very important to remember that the carcinogenesis slide that we saw in the first presentation, the risk is not eliminated by surgery and these patients do need a close follow-up and surveillance. Now, there are certain situations which require a change in plan. The first is a choledocal cyst associated with atrophic pancreatic head and chronic pancreatitis resulting from abnormal pancreaticobiliary ductal junction, which is long-standing. So, in these cases, you may need a Whipple procedure. Another is if the patient is severely ill, you may need to stage your procedures. You can externally drain let the infection settle and then do a complete cyst excision with a hepatico jejunostomy at a later date. There are some cases where there is so much inflammation that the cyst cannot be separated from vascular structures as a portal vein and hepatic artery. In these cases, what is important is that the mucosa at least should be stripped or destroyed by ablation 
so that the risk of cancer in that area reduces. So don't do overzealous surgery that completely seats needs to be removed and you injure portal vein or hepatic artery. It is okay that mucosa is stripped or destroyed by ablation. If the patient already has portal hypertension, then you may need a portosystemic shunt preoperatively and then polydocal cyst surgery. If there is a high suspicion of malignancy, you may need an intraoperative endoscopic ultrasound or and you may need frozen sections to determine if malignancy is present. So these are some of the special situations which may need modification in the conventional management of polydocal cyst. In advances in surgery, the predominant point is laparoscopy and robotic surgery. And both of these have now found to be safe and they have comparable outcomes to open surgery, provided that the center has high volumes and the surgeon is experienced in these techniques. Post-operative morbidity and mortality when we come to surgical outcomes and follow-up is low in children but high in adults. And this is understandable because with long-standing colloidal cyst in the abdomen, the inflammation in the surrounding structures is going to increase and therefore the post-operative morbidity is going to increase, right? A lot of adult patients have late complications in up to 40%. Type 4A, that is intra plus extra hepatic disease is most commonly complicated among all the types of polydocal cysts and the complications can be formation of intrahepatic stones and recurrent anastomotic strictures. Biliary malignancy, when it occurs in a patient of cholidocal cyst, it has dismal outcomes and median survival is 6 to 21 months. Like I said, even after excision, the risk of malignancy is not completely eliminated and that is why long-term surveillance is warranted in these patients. Tumor markers, alternate sonography and cross-sectional imaging is what you can do to follow up these patients. Music